Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. And welcome to our first episode of History 101, World Civ to 1500. I'm glad you can join us. So we got a long journey to go on, and we start at the beginning. We start with Homo sapiens sapiens. We start with us. We start with humans, modern humans. And we evolved 100,000 years ago and pretty quickly started moving out of Africa. We evolved in Africa and we started moving out of it and populating the globe. For the vast majority of that lifetime, we were nomadic. Humans have been nomadic. They have gone, moved from place to place looking for food. And they did this primarily as hunter-gatherers. Now later on, they'll be the semi-nomadic, they'll be husbandry with goats and sheep. Uh, but this is our main hunter-gatherer group. And the men hunted the protein. In the hunter-gatherer groups. Advantage. The advantage is the protein is extremely necessary for your build your muscles, for iron, for various other things. The protein is extremely necessary. The problem, the disadvantage, is hunting is not always successful. You you could talk to anyone who's a hunter, and you know that you could go out all day, sit in a blind for eight hours and get nothing that's an entire day worth of work wasted and you could go longer than that and get nothing so the protein is extremely important but it's not always successful you don't always have it women gathered the fruits and berries nuts and roots and they were much more dependable calories This made women economically important. That women's calories were more dependable than the men's. Made them economically important. To the tribe. To the group. And so with that economic importance comes rights and freedoms. And the most important of this is marriage. They will have a say in who the future father of their children will be. They'll have a say in the use of their body. And it is such an important right. It is such a basic right that many of you may be thinking it's not even a right. It's just the way things are. But it is. We have lots of institutions where people don't get to decide for themselves what to do with their body. The most established, the most um, long-lasting will be slavery. But there are many different systems. And so women have a say. Now, is it a total say that they could pick whoever they want, that they can marry for love? No, 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 no. We don't, no. No. The family is going to want to have a say. The tribe, this is, these are small groups. The tribe is going to want to have a say. They are not going to want the, the smart, witty uh, daughter of the, um, we're not going to want like a say anything. We don't want the smart, witty daughter who has lots going for her marrying to, like, the local punk. It, it, it's, no. The tribe is going to want to have a say in this. And so, but women gain rights because of their economic importance. They gain rights over their body. And they will gain a say in the running of the tribe. So, they have a right over their body.
and the tribe will move on when the food runs out. And these are groups somewhere between 100 and 1,000 people. They're relatively small. And these people are going to have to move. Now the horse changes everything. How does it change everything? Well, the first is it allows for wealth. The horse can carry more than the person can. So think of it like a car versus a backpack. Like, oh, I'm going to backpack across Europe or California. How much can you bring? Versus I'm going to rent a car. That's the first the first thing is you can carry more and that's more wealth. You can have more stuff. And so the horse allows, the domestication of the horse allows, excuse me, people to carry more stuff permanently. Because if you had to carry everything in your arms or your back, you can't carry that much. And if you have a baby, you can carry even less. So people got wealthier with the horse. I don't mean in money terms, but I mean in in quality of life terms. But where the horse really succeeds is in its advantages, its strategic and its tactical advantage. It's disadvantages it needs to eat. And so the horse, for the most part, even though it's, a, it's an all-terrain vehicle, it can go anywhere. The people who are going to be able to domesticate the horse and then use the horse to its fullest advantages are going to be on the step S T E P P E this great flatlands, the great flatlands, like the, the great plains in America and the step that goes from about Hungary or so in Europe, all the way to China, to Western, yeah, central China, at least. And we're going to talk about nomads, horse nomads in that area time and time and time again so the the major disadvantage of the horse is that it needs to eat and that's not so much of a disadvantage on the step there's plenty it's a giant highway of grass so so what are the advantages well the first is a strategic advantage the horse simply moves faster than people do And so it allows you to find food faster than other people, people on foot. It allows you to recover from mistakes. If you go into a valley and there isn't any food to hunt or gather, if you're walking, you're in trouble. You now got to get out of that valley and go find someplace else. Whereas on the horse, you're like, all right, well, this sucks. We missed it. Let's go find another valley. You can make more mistakes before it's a disaster for you. Whereas on foot, it can be a disaster pretty quickly. So it allows you, that speed allows you to get to food faster and farther away than if you're on foot. So it allows you to get there first. So it makes it more likely you're going to survive. The second thing is it gives you a tactical advantage in war. And as we're going to talk about, nomads fight all the time. And that tactical advantage is is physics. It's basic physics. It's gravity and momentum. And this is why the horse will be the major component of successful armies. War technology, basically, until the 20th century. That it gives you the advantage, especially in hand-to-hand combat. Before, before the gun, the cavalry is, is going to be um, important again and again and again. With the gun, it begins to change. It's not until we get to the machine gun, really, and then internal combustion engines that the horse uh, loses its role. But it gives you the advantage of gravity. Why? Because you're eight feet up in the air. And so when you're swinging down, stabbing down, You've got gravity on your side. 
Now you go, well, that doesn't count for much. Oh, uh, really? Uh, the guy below you has to swing up to hit you. He's working against gravity. And so you're always at an advantage. Swinging down, stabbing down. The second thing is momentum. You are moving at 20 miles an hour. Which means everything you throw, especially arrows you shoot, are moving at 20 miles an hour. And so it you already have this built-in force when you charge, when you stab, if you're moving when you stab, and you should be moving when you stab, if the arrow you shoot is already moving at a, at a compounded force versus if you're just standing there. And so again and again and again, we're going to see people on horses have a strategic and a st tactical advantage and win victories over people on foot. In fact, it's such an advantage that basically on the step, there are no people on foot. They got wiped out. They either domesticate the horse or they got wiped out. They got absorbed into tribes or got turned into slaves. And people who were on foot got pushed, who stayed on foot, got pushed into worse areas. They got pushed into river valleys. They got pushed into forest zones. They got pushed into mountains. They got pushed into places the horses couldn't go. One of those is going to be Mesopotamia, but they're going to be pushed into Mesopotamia. They're going to be pushed into uh, Central Europe and the forest. They're going to be pushed into t Tibet, into Tibet. They're going to be pushed into areas that's hard for horses to go. And they're going to figure, have to figure out how to make a lifestyle in these harder to hunt gather areas. So what about nomadic, war nomadic warfare and its effects? Well... These are professional soldiers, professional warriors, I should say. They're not soldiers, they're warriors. These are people who fight all the time. All men can fight. All men can shoot. Hunting is war on nature. They are going to fight every day of their lives against something, against other people or against nature. They are professional warriors and all men are warriors, 100%. From the age of 16 on, you're able to use weapons in war successfully. You might be able to do that earlier, depending on how strong you are. Uh, children will be able to ride horses. The, the Herodotus says this about the Persians, is they could ride horses before they could walk. So how do they fight? And how they fight, and we'll see this again and again and again, is the liquidation of competition. The people you are fighting against, it's not for land. You don't own anything because you have to move from place to place to place looking for food. There's no your land. There's the food of the season. So you go into a valley and you find groves like, like the, the, the book, the beach. You find the perfect place. It's got groves of fruit. It's got roots. It's got plenty of deer and antelope. It's got plenty of food. Great. Except there's somebody else there. Well, what do you do? If you just leave, maybe you find more food. Maybe you don't. If you don't, you starve. And that's the end of you. So what do you do? You fight. And so how do you fight? You kill the men, enslave the children, and kidnap the women. You destroy those people. You obliterate those people. Why? Because you don't tax them. There's no money. And they can eat your food. If not this year, 
next year. Like they are now competition. And so what do you do? You obliterate it. You kill the men because the men are useless. They're just going to compete. They, they, you, you'll never know that if they're loyal. So you kill the men. You enslave the children. Why? Because you're going to need future people. People die all the time. In the ancient world. All the time. Of all kinds of reasons. And so you enslave the children. To do menial labor. Feed the horses. I am a professional warrior hunter. I am not going to feed and wash my horse. I got other things to do. I got tribal stuff to do. I've got government stuff to do. I've got other things I got to do. So when I come back from the hunt, I give it to a kid, you know, a seven, eight year old kid and be like, you feed, make sure that my horse gets fed and wash my horse, take care of my horse. You know, we see this in, in the medieval times with squires. The squire is not technically a slave, it's an employee, but at the same time, it's a young kid whose job is to do menial labor, to do the, 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 the stupid work that the professional warrior hunter, the big leading man, doesn't want to do. You know, uh, that's why the children are in the semi-settled societies or in settled societies are shepherds a lot of the time. You don't have to do much. Just make sure that the, a wolf doesn't eat the, eat the sheep. If they do, call the other people. Call the, call the adults. You know, because if an adult man is, is doing that, it's a waste of their economic potential. And they kidnap the women. What happens next is by any modern standard it would be rape. But and I know there's the but, right? And it's difficult to talk about. But the idea is that women are an important possession. Because women give birth to the next generation. And we already talk about needing children. And those children will grow up into adults. And those adults will be workers in the tribe. And so, and what happens with those children is they get incorporated in. Let's, let's just go back to children for a moment. They'll get incorporated in by marriage. Like, I enslave. We go, we obliterate a tribe. We take some kids. Uh, either I take one or is that children child is assigned to me uh, to work for me. What What is likely to happen? That boy, let's call him a boy, is going to end up marrying my daughter. Very likely. And that incorporates him in. That allows the tribe to keep that child's labor as the child becomes an adult and makes it harder to maintain loyalty. And so, so we're able to incorporate that child into the tribe and I, I maintain their labor. Not only do I get their loyalty, I get their labor. Because now they're my son-in-law. They're, they're, they're married to my daughter. Well, how, how are you supposed to treat your father-in-law? You're supposed to do what he says. And so you enslave the children as children and, by, and you incorporate them in so that by the time they reach the age where they could, they could revolt and destroy you, they don't revolt and destroy you. They're incorporated into the tribe. They are, for all intents and reasons, not enslaved anymore. They are members of the tribe. And both sides consider themselves members of the tribe. The children do and the adults do. And that is, that is solidified with marriage whether to my daughter or my niece or some one of the women within my close-knit family. So let's go to women. What happens to women? Well,
women have a massive problem. And that is childbirth. The most dangerous thing you will ever do if you are a woman is give birth to a child. And in the ancient world, it was as likely to kill you as not. There is no medicine. That's to start there. There is no concept of medicine in a modern sense. There is no knowledge of what goes on inside the uterus. There is no knowledge of, of how babies are born. The only people who know how babies are born are people who gave birth to babies. And so that's where you get your midwife from. Men are not involved in this. Men are not. The childbirth is a woman-only domain. Men need not apply. You can't, men cannot mansplain this one. And in this way, nomadic societies are, um, men did men's things and women did women things. And there's a lot of overlap and togetherness. It's not segregation, but there are places that men do men's stuff and women do women's stuff. And childbirth is one of them. And so midwives experience women, women who have given birth before are your essential doctors in this in this case. But if the baby comes out bad, and if the baby, if you have a normal birth, you've got a good chance of surviving it. Baby comes out head first, you have, you will survive childbirth. The problem then is what happens afterwards. And those of you who have had children, those of you who have given birth, know that, well, let's ask you, was it a clean situation? Was it a, would you, would you want to wear white? Like a nice, would you go out and buy a nice white dress for this? It's not. There's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of it comes out. And the problem is, is that when things come out, things can go in and there's no concept of hygiene. There's no concept of soap. There's no concept of germs. There's none. And so what you get is what the British used to call childbed fever. Women gave birth in the dirt on the floor. Maybe on animal skins. And that meant that you could get an infection. So that's childbed fever. You give birth and everything seems fine. And then two, three days later, you get a fever and you're hot and you're sweating. And your bones ache. And two days after that, you're dead. Which is basically, it's basically a blood infection. And it just runs rampant right through your, your blood. Using the bloodstream, it goes right through all your organs. It just runs right through you. So women die at a higher rate than men. By a lot. Because every time you get pregnant... You are now rolling the dice with, is this the child who's going to kill you? Because if the baby comes out head first, you, you probably survived a childbirth and now you have to worry about the infection. But if the baby comes out sideways or backwards, you've got a massive problem. And that massive problem is likely to kill everybody. The child, the woman, everybody. And remember, there's no anesthesia. There's nothing. If your childbirth goes too long, if the cord is too short, if there's no way of going in and getting, getting something out. There's no tools for this. And so women die all the time. And so women are a precious resource for the tribe. 
And so you don't kill other tribes' women. You kidnap them. And you marry them off within the tribe. You marry them off to other men. Widowers. Basically. Now, we live in a world where women live longer than men, but that's a 20th century invention. That's not true through almost all of human history because of childbirth. Take a look. And there's no reason why you would take a look, but take a look at insurance rates. Life insurance rates. That's, that is a perfect encapsulation of what, because life insurance is a bet on who dies. And so it's a company versus a person. The person is betting that they that you know they could die at any time. While the company's like, well, if you live, if you only live X amount, we lose money. But if you live Y amount, we win money. And so we'll give you a discount if it's going to be on Y. And we're going to charge you more if it's X. So a seventy-year-old man wanting to get life insurance is going to have to pay a lot of money. Whereas a 20-year-old woman pays very little. So if you look at life insurance rates in the 19th century, women are expensive. If you look at life insurance rates now, women are cheap. Like, my wife doesn't cost anything. She, they threw her in, in my, on my life insurance. They took, we got life insurance. They said, okay, this is going to be your life insurance. This is how much you're going to pay per month. I'm like, okay. Seems fair. All right, let's do my wife. And they're like, oh, come on. Like, she ain't dying anytime soon. We'll throw her in. Uh, here, this nominal fee. Like, okay, that's nice. And if, you, and if you have kids and you get children's life insurance, it's, it's nothing. You could get uh, $20,000, $100,000 on, on your five-year-old for, for pennies, for nothing. That wasn't true in the 19th century. Children, and, and the farther back you go, children and women died at much higher rates. They don't live as long as men. Because of childbirth. Because of childhood diseases. Penicillin changes everything. The ability to stop infections changes everything. Modern medicine doesn't start till at least ether, with the ability to have surgery that you're not awake for. So what are we talking, the 1830s? And certainly penicillin. Like, that's modern medicine. Before that, there is, there is just not. This, this, doctors are more likely to kill you than to not. That's what happened to... Uh, one of our presidents, who was assassinated, Garfield, McKinley, I think it's Garfield, who was shot and they basically killed him taking out the bullet. If they had just left the bullet, he probably would have been fine. He probably would have recovered. So, um, you kidnap the women. And so, you didn't marry them off. Is this rape? Well, there's not a whole lot of consent built into this. So, the answer is yes. Because any modern concept of consent is not part of this. She didn't get to choose who the husband would be. These are foreigners. They won't speak the same language. She's going to have sex with this man whether she wants to or not. So, there's your... So, is there rape? Yes. But does she get incorporated into the tribe? Also, yes. Can that kidnapped woman become an important member of the function of that tribe? Yes.
so is she a slave? Ultimately not. Like, yes, in the beginning, and ultimately not. So, what we have is a complicated situation by modern definitions, because it's fluid. But it's also, and this is important to understand, normal. This is expected. Rule one of this class is don't lose. When you lose, bad things happen. When you lose at war, the men are dead, the children are enslaved, and the women are married to somebody else. Don't lose. When a city is sacked, the men are murdered, the children are enslaved, the women are raped, and then married off to somebody else. And then all your good, and because settled people have more stuff, all your goods are taken. Don't lose. When you lose, it's bad. And it's bad for everyone involved. And everyone knows it's going to be bad for everyone involved. And so this is normal. This is the way war works. This is not outrageous. This is the, the rules of war are the men get killed, the children are enslaved, and the women are kidnapped to be raped and married. Now, the in, women and the children will become part of that new tribe and will be incorporated in their children and their children's children will have no difference between them. So there's a process of incorporation. But if you're walking on the step and 15 horse people are out on the horizon and they see you, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. Whether you're a man, a woman, or child. And that, and you knew that from the very beginning. You didn't wave them and say, hey, uh, you were in trouble and you knew it. So war is all the time versus nature. This is the hunting. Animals don't want to be caught. Deer don't want to be turned into venison. Deer like being deer and making little deers. And so nature has helped them develop ways of not letting them be turned into food. And so you have to hunt. You have to trap. You have to lie. You have to deceive. You have to use tactics. You have to lure you have to surround animals to capture them. You're also at war against other nomads. Sometimes, though, as we get further into this course, you will war against subtle people. And that's where the stories of the nomads and their destruction come around, where they scare people. Nomads are scary. They are always scary. In American history, they're scary. The Indians of the West on horses are the toughest ones, right? The Iroquois, the Huron, the um, the ones. I mean, we 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 tell the Thanksgiving story of the pilgrims of these English pilgrims, and they meet and they're happy, and they're all going to sit and eat together. That's not the Apache. The story of the Apache are badass biker gang warriors on horses, the Comanche. The Sioux. These are not, let's all get together and have turkey. No. This is, this is, this is Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. This is war and destruction on the horizon. These are the last people to be conquered. Not the settled nomads who are, who are doing some light farming and husbandry. Or doing real farming and husbandry, I should say. In the east, in the forest zones of the east, out on the Great Plains, these are going to become horse peoples. And horse peoples are immediately going to obliterate or push non-horse peoples. They are going to do on the Great Plains, because horses are not native to America, so the Spanish had to bring them over, Cortez to Mexico and the such. And they get released and they the horses migrate throughout North America. Well, the foot nomads in the Great Plains 
domesticated them, captured them, domesticated them, and then those who could, the Comanche, the Apache, the Sioux, started to beat up on those who didn't. So they're scary. Nomads are scary dudes. And look at our stories, whether it's the, the Comanche, the Sioux, or the Apache, or the Mongols, the Huns, or even if you know your Bible, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They're not the four walking dudes of the apocalypse. They're the four horsemen. When, when St. Peter, not St. Peter, Joseph wanted to talk about how the world was going to end. He was a settled person living in the Roman Empire at its height in 100 AD in a world of cities. And what did he imagine would destroy it? Men on horses. Joseph may never have seen a nomadic horse tribe on the move. But that's how he imagined. That's how settled people imagined the end of the world. Horsemen. Nomadic horse people coming out of the steppe and ra ra raging through their cities and destroying them. Why? Because it had happened to settled people. It was an ingrained fear of settled people. Just like people after 1945, it's going to be the nuke. What is going to destroy America, New York, Chicago? The nuke. And now that we're post-Cold War, like when I grew up, nobody cared about plagues. I grew up in the age of AIDS and nobody cared about plagues. The Cold War ends and now all of a sudden it's the plague that people are worried about. It's bird flu and it's swine flu and it's the pandemics and it's the people with no, no vaccination that's going to wipe out the world. It's, it's Stephen King's The Stand. It's the flu that's going to murder everybody. That's what people now are afraid of. Why? Because the giant country is wanting them nuke each other and obliterate cities is less likely to happen. So from my childhood, when AIDS happened, nobody cared. Like that's the sad, for the first 10 years of AIDS, it was the gay plague. Straight people didn't get. Now, by the end of the 80s, once they figured out that straight people could get it, people freaked out. And so if you are of a Generation X, you have if you grew up in the 80s, you're messed up, especially when it comes to sex and relationships, because the stories you got was if you have sex, you will die. And so when we talk about the end of the world in the 80s, we have this transition from Nuclear war, which my parents were desperately worried about, and I was worried about as a child, to the plague. Whether it's the sex plague of AIDS, whether it is the flu that's going to wipe you out. That's the new disease. When I was a kid, the flu was a uh, bad thing you got. You spent five days in, in, in bed, you didn't go to school, and you ate a lot of soup and had some ice cream. And then you went back to school the next week. I mean, really, you were sick for like three, four days. And you were really sick for a while. But no one talks about how the flu killed people. And yet the flu kills people all the time. But we're like, don't worry about that. Now there's the vaccine, I suppose. And it works. And it's good for old people to get. And it's good for children to get. Because those are the most vulnerable. But when city people think about the end of the world, they think about the horsemen in the ancient world destroying them. It is men on horses that are scary. And so in our next episode, we are going to talk about government. And we'll show how nomadic horse peoples organize their societies.